Um, thanks for coming today. This is a, a talk about the arc of .NET. Um, I'm going to talk about from way back in the beginning all the way through to now, what you need to do right now to get ready to go through to the next phase of .NET, what that means, and why we're going there. So that's uh, the talk today. And I'm making a couple of claims here. First of all, by saying I'm going to do this, I'm sort of implying that I think I have something to say and I, I know something here. And second of all, I'm, I'm claiming to be independent. And so I rarely show a bio slide, but I think in this one it's a fair thing to do um, to give you guys, that's not what you want to see, that's what you want to see. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on me. I have been in the Microsoft space for a really long time. I did spend six months out of it when my boss decided I'd spent too long in it, and he said, boop, I just went to work for the company, just went to work for him. He said, yeah, I'm not going to let you do anything for .NET for a while. And so I did Python and uh, on a Mac and, and uh, AWS and all that. So I've been around a tiny bit, but mostly in Microsoft space. Um, I've been an MVP since 90, 1998. And in my opinion, what that means is I've been a thorn in Microsoft's side for a long, long, long time. And happily, they've mostly forgiven me for it. Um, but I think that my job and your job is to help Microsoft understand what we need as real developers in the real world because they do kind of live in an ivory tower, uh, even though they do try to get out and mix. Is there any Microsoft people here? No, no, nobody that I say. Good, then I can say anything I want. Uh, great. Yeah, I didn't know whether somebody from the team was going to show up, uh, which would be great to answer questions, and uh, I really don't care that much if I annoy them. Uh, they've, uh, can, they've pretty much forgiven me. But I have been contributing to the languages, um, and there's features in there that I've helped to, uh, to get in and things I've helped to fix, and I'm very proud of, of that. It's one of the things I'm proudest of in my uh, career, and, uh, but they've done all the work. It's been great. I've just said, the associate property for the null reference operator is wrong and make a big fuss about it and yell a lot, and then they fix it. They have to do all the real work. Uh, so that's me. And uh, let's look back at the beginning of .NET. So let's kind of jump back in around 2000, give or take a couple of years. Um, around 2000, what did the world look like? Because some of you weren't there, actually, which is so odd to think about. Some of you weren't there, and some of you that were there have really tried to forget. So I'm going to take you back and let you remember. Uh, first of all, we had C++, and this is about what C++ looked like. It was incredibly powerful, and it could do absolutely anything, but you sort of needed a team, and you better know how to drive it because you could get into a lot of trouble. That's sort of where C++ was around 2000. But there was another player in the Microsoft space, and that was Visual Basic. And what did Visual Basic look like? About like that. It got there. It was the tortoise and the tortoise and the hare race. It always got there. In fact, development went pretty fast. But it was kind of like, hmm, it's a, it was a little old-fashioned. It was a little slow. We got to the finish line, but, you know. And I was a Visual Basic person. I, I, I love Visual Basic. I was C++ before Microsoft. So I do know C++ as well. Um, and then there was the rest of the world. What did the rest of the world look like from a Microsoft perspective? If you looked out across the landscape from sitting from, as a Microsoft developer, what did it look like? The road ahead didn't look so good. Neither C++ nor Visual Basic could go forward at that time. There were too many pressures on it. Visual Basic had too many shortcomings. C++ was too hard to use, blah, blah. And starting in around 1995, there was this competitor out there. It was named after coffee for of all things. So um, Java was released in 1995, and by 2000, Java was getting increasing market share and was really, really the, the up-and-coming thing. And as a Microsoft person, you're like, yeah, I know that JVM runs everywhere, but, you know, I don't know. It'd be kind of nice if we ha still had a Microsoft tool. The politics are different. We kinda, eh, we'd be good with that. So, uh, so we had Java, and Java was there. And when you're sitting there and you have this morass ahead of you, and what do you do? I mean, you have this, this morass. What do you do? You need, you need a mild-mannered person who can come jumping out of a phone booth, right? You need Superman now. You need to find Clark Kent because you can't get Superman until you have Clark Kent to put in the phone booth. Until I get in the phone booth, you can't come out of the phone booth, right? So you need a mild-mannered person who can come jumping out of a phone booth and save the day. And where do you look for a mild-mannered person who can save the day? In Denmark, of course. <laughs> so, Anders Halsberg joined Microsoft in about 1996. And by 1998, the Project Cool was named. It had a name. Cool. 
That stands for C++ C++ like or C like C like all of that is one C and C has a soft C but it's hard C now because it's a C but anyway it's a C that's the first object oriented C like object oriented language okay that's what cool was unfortunately Microsoft one of many times this has happened Microsoft failed to check the trademark before they named their tool and therefore they had to change the name and nobody had a good trademark on C sharp except for some musicians and that was already like public domain and so the musicians couldn't really claim c sharp and so we got c sharp and that was a great name and we've lived happily ever after so here comes along .net and .net and c sharp um, so these two vehicles look a lot the same and i'm going to do have a little bit of license here and someone who really knows cars can later tell me how wrong i am but for right now go with me okay so the one on the left they look like they look a lot the same but the one on the left is actually a souped up dodge dart you don't know what a Dodge Dart is. I'm sorry. I don't know the best European analogy for a Dodge Dart, but it's, it's an older vehicle, fairly small engine, uh, smaller wheelbase. And uh, so, so it's a, it kind of older at this point because at 2000, Java is five years old. Okay. On the other side, we got a swoop back, cool looking Camaro, bigger engine, ready to go. Oof. Okay. So these two cars are different, but they look the same. They look the same because they are designed to do precisely the same thing. Car, go straight line fast, short distance, okay? .NET and Java save your universe. Give you a future forward in development that you will be happy with. We've been through several, like we're happy for a while, now we're not happy. We're happy for a while, now we're not happy. We needed to be happy again. And that was the purpose of C Sharp and Java. So let's take a look at them together. So Java was was a strongly and statically typed language with a manifest. That means when you picked up a DLL, you could look inside of it and you could say, hey, this is what's here. Then we had, it was also object-oriented, class-based. That's pretty cool. And it was semi-interpreted. Had something called a VM, a JVM that could run anywhere. Now that was pretty cool stuff in 1995. It was garbage collection, it was trace garbage collection. We pretty much have three worlds of garbage collection. No garbage collection, C++, good luck, don't make any mistakes. And then we had reference counted garbage collection, which was in many tools, including Visual Basic, which says when you create things that will be expensive, when you create things, we will set up to destroy them. That's the short story. And there is, by the way, this one really big catch, which is if you do the wrong thing, we will keep it forever. And then we had the third thing, which is trace garbage collection, which is a little newer at that point. And trace garbage collection says it is fast as a dickens to create something. But, you know, once in a while, you're going to have to give me a little time because somebody's got to take the trash out. and It's going to take a little bit of time. So trace garbage collection pushes that time. It's always expensive to either create or destroy. It pushes that time to some indefinite point in the future when a lot of garbage will be collected together. And so I could explain all the technical things behind it, none of which is interesting. That's the only part that matters. And it had curly braces. Why do curly braces matter? Because we think we're still driving the Humvee. We think we're still cool. We think we're out there, right? Okay, we love curly braces. And there was reflection, which means that code could look at itself and look at other code. And so these are pieces of, of uh, Java in uh, 1995, 2000, the same. .NET. Let's take a look at .NET. Well, statically and strongly typed with manifest. We already talked about what that meant. Mm, object oriented. Yeah, we know what that is. Okay. Oh, it's different. It has MSIL instead of the JVM. And I, it's, it sounds a little bit like a small thing. It's, you know, three letters and four. and doesn't seem like it's a big deal. It actually is. Because MSIL running on the runtime, the .NET runtime, is far more tied in. It's more of a thin wrapper across the operating system. And because this, it was more difficult to ever have .NET get traction off of Windows platforms. It was a, it was a little bit of a hard sell politically. Oh, uh, no, okay, no. It was a really hard sell politically. And because uh, people that weren't on the Windows platforms, they didn't want to have anything to do with Microsoft. That's why they weren't on Windows. And so they didn't absorb mono and they didn't absorb the alternatives very well. So that was a little bit different. Garbage collection, trace garbage collection. .NET did not have trace garbage collection because they were copying Java. It had trace garbage collection because it was the best idea of the day. Proved out by history because almost every language that has done anything since then uses trace garbage collection. 
Okay, so that was like the right way to do that. And we had curly braces in C sharp, and we had reflection. Hmm, okay, they look about the same. But they weren't the same. There were also some differences. So let's take a quick look at those. And this is a very high level of this. There, you could go a lot deeper into this conversation. First of all, they had some different types. Java has a type. It's an arbitrary position type, which also SQL has, which is where if you only do .NET, that's where you would have seen this. So like eight characters to, the, to one side of the decimal point, five characters to the other side of the decimal point. That's what arbitrary position means. Uh, .NET came along, and it didn't have that, but it did have a full decimal type. It's one of the most important types in .NET. I will keep saying this. I, my goal is this year, I'll say it every time I get on stage. You should use a decimal unless you know for a fact you need the performance of a double. Change all your do doubles to decimal, but actually be careful because it's a break and change. Uh, so be careful in your code with that, but you should use decimal in all locations where you do not, you do not have proof that you need the double because you won't. You won't find it uh, pretty much. I mean, it's three people here in the entire conference are actually doing financial modeling, and they actually do need the double, but nobody else really needs it. It's very, very rare. Oh, they have primitive types in Java. This is the biggest difference, okay? So Java has a primitive type. It's in the language. It's baked in. It's truly part. Of, it, it's real. It's special. And then they also have classes. Primitive types do not come from a common root, while .NET does not have that separateness. They have what's called a value type, and an integer is a value type, a date time is a value type, a GUID is a value type. All of the things are a, they're a, 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 a specialization of a root type called object. So everything in .NET comes from object. This actually is a difference. Um, primitive types have to be wrapped. They have no methods on their own. In .NET, um, everything, including an integer, can have a can methods, can have properties. It can even support interfaces. An integer supports an iComparable interface and therefore has a compare to method. Cool, okay? Different primitive and reference types, uh, value and reference types, um, that we ha can have defined new operators, which means if you create a point class or an imaginary number class before .NET had it, then you could add operators to that. Enumerations uh, are class-based. I'm not going to go into this, but what you call an enum is fundamentally different in Java and .NET. So there are differences. There's some pretty... Oh, delegates. Oh, that's another big one. You know how we use delegates? We got that function, you know, the save pointer to a function, all the stuff we've been using it since 2000, since the very, very beginning. We've got that. Yeah, not so much in Java. And because of that, Java has to use a series of patterns to do exactly the same thing. So if you're a Java programmer, you live and breathe patterns deeper than .NET programmers do. It's just because .NET's easier for this particular set of things. .NET's just easier. Okay, so they are different. They are the same. That was the world. And why did I go here first? It's because there's some fundamental things. Oh, the race was on you. Yeah. Okay, so there was some fundamental differences in things that .NET did because of this history. And they're still with us. And one of them I want you to go back and change your code about. So there's two different languages, C Sharp and VB, fundamentally different audiences. C Sharp was designed to convert Java programmers, and VB was, con was designed to save Visual Basic programs. And I would argue that they both failed miserably at what they set out to do. So Visual Basic programmers uh, had a difficult time. Many of them that did stay went to C Sharp. And uh, even early on, I waited for a long time, but I did eventually drink the Kool-Aid and go to C-sharp. And uh, C-sharp actually did convert some Java programmers, some C++, Jones over here going, me, me, uh, some C++ programmers, um, but largely it also brought new people into the industry. They both did. And these were just really exciting, wonderful languages of the day. Um, C-sharp is in by far larger use today. You can also fix possible deficiency in Java. I think I've touched on these before, but um, .NET had the opportunity to do things differently. So it could do things like the common uh, base types that were arguably a, an improvement on Java. And then here's the big one, is performance. It was believed that, it, that .NET would be dead out of the gate if it wasn't as fast as Java. Whether that's true or not, it's irrelevant. It was absolutely believed. And because of that, there's one thing I want you to go change in your code that exists because of the performance race in 2000. This is a long time ago. Can we please get over this? And that is a failure to do integer checks in C-sharp. It is a very small performance hit today. Very, very, very small. It does mean that every single time you do addition or subtraction with an integer, it's checked to see if it's overflowed. But every single other mathematic thing you do that overflows or does something else wrong throws an exception in your face and you fix it. 
no, yeah, no, not, not so much an integer in .NET. You go to maximum value and add one, what do you get? Not an error. You get the min value, I think, although I was thinking about that and thinking about the bits, and I was all of a sudden not sure, but I do think it is min value. Okay, um, I was just thinking about the sign bits and blah, blah, blah. But yes, so maximum value goes to minimum value, minimum value minus one goes to maximum value. Not what you meant to do. So check that particularly, particularly. Check that if there's any place in your code that you are using anything other than a long. You're much more likely to get bigger than the maximum value if you're using a short or a byte. A couple of other things, the same thing there. Would like to see you change that one. Okay, so let's look at the time because I forgot to tell you guys, I haven't done this talk before. And uh, therefore, I, and I don't have the time, I apologize, I'm going to grab my phone. Um, I've done this talk before, and so there's a possibility that I'm going to either be short or long, in which case we'll have a chat or uh, I will cut into John's time, which I'll try not to do. Okay. We're fine so far. Okay. All right, so .NET. I've been saying 2000, but that's because in 2000 we had a the beginning of a beta that was fairly public, and many people were actually even going to production by uh, 2001, late 2001. 2002, February, early, Febu uh, early 2002, something like February, was when .NET uh, was actually fully re released. Now, um, the... It was four, yeah, but we already did that. So it was object-oriented, trace, garbage collection, all the things we, we said. It's very painful for VB programmers. There's a whole separate talk I could do on the arc of VB, but it would be like a tragedy instead of like a, a nice, this is where we're going talk. So um, 2003, we had a release that nobody remembers, .NET 1.1, and uh, then we had 2005. For all practical purposes, 2005 is the beginning of time for .NET. That's when things started being real. We got generics. We got uh, generics. We got uh, anonymous methods, iterators, nullables, a lot of things that you can hardly think of the language without. We're not there prior to 2005. And also by this point, C Sharp did not suck as badly as it did when it started. And there is no question why anybody went to C Sharp is beyond my comprehension because one of the differences between C Sharp and VB is that VB was an incremental compiler from day one. VB.NET has never been anything else than an incremental compiler, which meant that IntelliSense actually worked in Visual Basic.NET first. And guess what, C Sharp folks, if you were there, it didn't. You barely had syntax checking. And then by 2005, the parallel... Uh, interpreter that I mean the parallel thing that looked at the code and figured it out in order to give you IntelliSense in C Sharp was starting to not suck too badly and so um, by then C Sharp was usable. Uh, coming from VB it was just flat not usable without IntelliSense but the VB programmers would never have come so you have IntelliSense because of VB. I mean you would have eventually gotten it I think but VB had it so it came into uh, to Visual Studio and the C Sharp coders go why don't we have that? And they said, yeah, because we have this really fast compiler. It's really cool. It's a great compiler. It's a really, really good compiler. But because it's a compiler that doesn't run until you tell it to run, we got no idea about your code. And everybody says, yeah, we don't care. Get over it. Give us IntelliSense. And they did, which was great. So let's look at 2005 and what the road ahead looked then. And it was actually kind of beautiful. I, I did fall just because it was pretty, but I don't mean to say it's like there was doom in the air. Because we did not feel that. At least I didn't. I don't think very many people, 2005.NET coders, felt anything other than here's a great future out there and we're ready to go. That's what 2005 felt like. It was a good time. So let's go back and look at a couple of changes. There weren't much changes uh, in 2006. Okay, does anybody remember what happened in 2006? We got four things. Can anybody name what they were? No. <laughs> John is never wrong. I'm so happy now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, nobody? Okay. I'll give you three of them. Who can name the fourth? Anybody? I love this. Any, all of you here, not one of you can tell me the name of the fourth thing. Some of you could tell me what it had something to do with. What? Link, not link. Nope, link didn't come till later. No. Card space, the most forgotten major technology of our time. Okay, 2008, we got Link. So you were right, but you were off by a couple of years. Okay, Lambdas, we got extension methods, bunch of fun stuff in 2008. You remember that release, right? That was a fun release. It was just flat fun. Great release. 2010 was actually a big release for Visual Studio. 
So this is when Visual Studio got rewritten. And oh my gosh, that was a scary release. I don't know if anybody here was on the public beta, but the last public beta before release was unusably slow. You could not use it for real development. It was too slow. That was the last public release three months before release. And I'm going, this is not going to go well. And one of the reasons was is that there was an entirely new technology that Microsoft decided to invent on its own because, well, well, because. And that was meth. Okay, you may remember the managed extensibility framework or know what it is. You may know what it is? What is it? What does it do? Nobody knows? Yeah, go ahead. You guys raise your hand and wait for me to call on you. I'm not used to it. Go ahead. Shout it out. And... It's a bit like dependency injection, but not really. It's for discovering... I'm just going to call it dependency injection if that's okay. It's a bit like a dependency injection, but yeah, there's some differences. And yes, we could have a conversation about that further. I'm just going to say dependency injection and go with that, okay? So if you disagree with me, just deal with it. Okay, it's close. I mean, it really is close enough for... for uh, everything we care about. But that's what Visual Studio 2010 is entirely based on it. And MEF is not built with sufficient uh, performance. And therefore, shortly, during to, late in 2010, late in that release and going forward, MEF split for the first time. It split twice. And the future is still unclear. And I actually had a business card. I, used to, I still own the, the URL for uh, Crystal MEF Labs. It's what I used as my business for a name for a while. And so I was very heartbroken that MEF is going nowhere. But now I think I'll give up the domain if anyone wants it. We also got PCLs, big thing. I'm not going to talk as much as you think I'm going to talk about PCLs today. But that was how we could target multiple uh, things by saying, I want to target all these things. Please tell me what I can still do as I target all of this range of things. And it tells you the three or four things that you can still do at that point that will work across all of those uh, features. So, we got that. Oh. Okay, what did it look like ahead in 2010? Okay, so this is a really interesting time because the future started looking vague. And it started looking vague in a way that Microsoft really never talked about it like this. And, and I have no idea what other companies were thinking at that point. But Azure is, is launched at this point, and Microsoft has begun to believe that what it wants for the futures is your CPU cycles. Okay, they, that's the future as they see it is, own, is having your data and your CPU on their boxes so they can charge you for compute and for storage. That is, be, that is what Azure is, okay? So they see Azure as the future. They are starting to look to Azure. They're starting to pile up reasons you want to go to Azure by giving you toys and tools and things to make your life easier. And that's their job is to make it worth your time to go to Azure. But in 2010, Azure's launched. And they start looking at a couple of things that are happening. Oh, I forgot to mention, way back in 2003 on that slide, I did talk about the Compact Framework. That's Microsoft's first mobile attempt. This would be Microsoft ready to do their third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or something like that. I used to think that when Steve Ballmer said, developers, 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 under his breath he was going, developers, except those no mobile developers. Developers, except those mobile developers. Because Microsoft managed to shaft them so many times, I could not believe that anyone was still developing for them. And I'm quite sure I know why. Because those groups, this is probably top secret NDA, don't tell anybody. They got some devices from Microsoft sometime. I think they were strictly bribed. Because why would you still do, would you still be an MVP when you're standing up in front of people going, hey, you should go to the Compact Framework. Oh, gosh, it doesn't support it anymore. Oh, gosh, you should do this. Oh, gosh, that doesn't, oh, gosh, it changed again. So that was the world as we had phones coming on the scene big way. We had Azure, and it turns out they need the same thing. That was not actually obvious in 2009. It became obvious fairly quickly afterwards. The biggest of the big and the smallest of the small need exactly the same thing. Which, by the way, is not this huge monolithic dot net giant thing <laughs> that walks into the room. That's not what it needs. It needs this little tiny thing. This is all I need. Okay, here's the box. That's all I need. It'll fit in the box. Small box, small box. So we needed to make this big shift, okay? And Microsoft started thinking about this, but they were in so way, they were not ready for this at all. They're going, oh, how are we going to do this? Tanya was created starting in 1998. Can you even imagine the code that's in there? And at the same time, the compilers are a dozen times worse. If you ever even thought about what was inside the compilers at this point, you would have just never slept at night. 
Okay, so the couple projects started, including the Roslyn project, moving forward to having a new compiler around 2010. So, 2012 came along, and we got async and await, one of the other things needed for the small platform. We had to have a good async and await story. And um, I, I, I get slightly annoyed at async and await when I talk to people because the complaint I hear is, oh, if I use async and await, it's everywhere. I have to put it everywhere. And I know some of you are thinking, yeah, it's really annoying. You have to put it everywhere, okay? And I think about this analogy. Okay, do you guys know what a solar tube is? It's a, it's a round pipe, and it's very reflective, and you put it on your roof, and it has a special collector, and then the, the light bounces down, and you can get light into a dark part of your house. And so let's say I have a, a laundry room in my basement that's quite dark, and I want to give it some natural light. So I say, hmm, i got a closet above that. I will just take the solar tube, and I'll put it on my roof, and I'll put that pipe down, and it'll come out of my basement. And won't that be nice? Okay. That's async and await. Over here, you've got something you can actually wait for, okay? And you have to pipe it back, okay? All the way back to the thing that could actually possibly wait. In the Windows world, this is easy. You've got a, a you know, you know that you're waiting for people to click buttons and stuff like that. That's the message, the, the message queue that's sitting there, okay? You know you're waiting, okay? You have to go from the thing you are at to a different server to go get some data. You have to go all the way from that point back to your, to your place you could actually wait. The ASP.NET, you got this thing over here that's going off to another server, might be slow. You have to go all the way back to IIS and ASP.NET and your infrastructure because that's what can actually wait, okay? That's why you have to go top to bottom that's the short version of my async await talk, but I thought I'd share it while we, this came up on the slide. I'm kind of drifting a few directions from what I said I'd talk about, but we'll get through it all. So this was also Windows Store. Tanya 4.5 introduced support for something called ETW, and this was another thing I went into. I've done like three or four things that like I, big time, I'm teaching this, I'm going into this, and nobody ever cared. It was so sad. Workflow, MEF, and ETW. And I'm so sad that you guys are not, you guys are going, I have no idea what ETW does. Everybody here, it's anybody here other than maybe John, does, and it's only because he has struggled trying to support it. Does anybody here know what ETW is other than John? What is it? Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's your new logging. It can log, get this, 10,000 events per second, and you won't be able to find it in your profiling. Isn't that interesting? Okay, look into event source and ETW. We got it a long time ago. Uh, and it is helping you even though you don't see it because all of that new cool stuff that you get in terms of profiling and all those new features, that little annoying graph that you watch, you go, I wonder what that's doing. Uh, all that stuff comes from ETW. Okay, so that's 2012. It's this, okay. Uh, you also, first time, Visual Studio has backwards compatibility and you've got the all caps menu. Yay, team! Yeah, okay. So uh, we got that and then 2012. 13 comes along, and we got that. It's just kind of a small release in a lot of ways. Uh, we did get some stuff on WinForms that was really important there. And uh, we began embracing regular updates, which means we had update 1, update 2, update 3, update 4. And what's big about update 4 of Visual Studio 2013? Does anybody know? Oh, you don't know. Did I get that here? <laughs> you could check a box instead of going to the registry to get rid of the all caps menu. Did you guys do that? Did anybody know that? It's still really annoying, right? Okay, so 2014, 2015, what did the road ahead look like right now? Azure at this point is pretty darn good. AWS is pretty darn good. Google Cloud is pretty darn good. We got, <laughs> we got cool stuff that's out there. And we're sitting on a rock not quite sure how we're going to get there. That's kind of where we're at in 2014, 2015. And this is the point at which Microsoft sort of gets out the cat out of the bag that is going to redo everything, everything. Now, at this point, the Rasm project's pretty much finished, but they're going to redo. They're going to go to open source. They're going to get your head around this. They're going to redo the .NET framework. Now, they didn't actually say out loud big flashing billboards, we're going to rewrite the .NET framework because everybody, including their stockholders, should have freaked out if they did that. But they're going to look at every line of code 
because that's the only way you can get onto other platforms. You have to find every line of code that could hurt you going to another platform. And at the same time, you have to reorganize because you can no longer be this big monolith. And this process has been, in, the .NET team had been working on this in bits and pieces and fits and spurts for quite a while. But at this point, they fully commit to the fact that they will create a small, componentized, modularized .NET in open source. Cool, right? And from that point forward, they have created full confusion, and that's really the rest of this talk. He's trying to unwind the confusion that came from that, because, oh my gosh, there's a lot of things to decide now. Oh my gosh, every time they come up with, gosh, they came up with a new word again. Oh my gosh, where did ASP.NET 5 go? Well, it's, it's ASP.NET Core now. How is that hard? But it is easier than saying ASP.NET 5, MVC 6, and Indie Framework 7. So it is an improvement. But now, oh my gosh, they rename things. That was a year and a month ago. Okay? It's been chaos. It's been chaos. And we're going to unwind that for the rest of the talk. Okay, 2015, uh, Rosalind Compilers. Visual Studio actually does light up. I know this is a terrible, awful, like, you know, one of those weird little advertising kind of things, but this is where we got perf tips. You know how long anything took when you're running in the debugger. If you haven't noticed those little numbers, they're important. We got um, the, uh, the, the debug peak, which allows you to use conditional, uh, conditional breakpoints with some degree of grace for the first time. Conditional breakpoints have been there since 2000. There's nothing new about this, but now it's graceful. You can get in there and do it. Okay. And also, the big news of 2015, it's the default now. No more all caps menus for the default. How many of you want to go back to all caps menus? I just want to tell you how to do it. <laughs> the checkbox is still there. You can go check it if you want to, okay? They didn't change that. They just made it unchecked by default, which was a really good decision. Okay, any questions so far? I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to check my time, too. And I hope I go till 11.20, because that's how long I'm going to talk to. So hopefully that's actually correct. I think it is. Okay. Oh, SP.NET. I was going to go through SP.NET, and then when I went through this in my, you know, when I was planning and, and doing this, I got, at this point, you guys are done with history. So I'm just going to put that up there, like, take a quick look at it, and uh, I'm not going to go through that. I'm actually not as familiar with ASP.NET because I, I didn't think the internet was going to go anywhere, so I didn't invest a lot in learning ASP. I never did ASP programming. I did a lot of early ASP.NET programming in web forms before I decided it really sucked, and then I stopped doing that and did some AM MVC, uh, early MVC stuff, and that was great, except that MVC4 came along and broke everything I did, and that pissed me off. So it's just been a rough ride for me. So uh, I, I'm not going to go through that history in detail. Okay, so this was 2014, just a reminder of where we were and where we're going to go, because 2017 looks about like this, okay? We're building a bridge to the future. I mean, that, and I say we really loosely because I actually believe for a very long time the community is an integral part, a non-removable part of the Microsoft ecosystem. And if I say it like that, you go, well, well that's kind of obvious. You remove us. There is no ecosystem. But always Microsoft has had some ear to the community. Um, I've been giving them feedback for over 20 years now, and that's a long time. They have been out there at times trying not to listen and at times listening really well. And right now they're really trying to listen. So when I say the word we, it's not because I work for Microsoft. I know that's a little bit confusing. But we're building a, a bridge. Hopefully it's a kind of better looking bridge than this. It kind of looks like an you know, under-repair bridge. But we are looking at a bridge going forward, and that's why things are confusing. So the way I'm going to explain this is a little different. Um, I, it will be a sufficiently complicated slide by the end that you will feel that you're in the right room. Um, but, but I'm going to do this a little differently than you've seen it. And I really would like feedback at the end about whether this adds any clarity uh, to what you've seen. And you have seen lots of boxes, and I'll show you boxes because, well, it's a, it's a .NET course talk, so how could you not have boxes? Okay, so what is .NET? .NET is a runtime. Remember back at the very beginning, we talked about the JVM and MSIL. It is still a runtime. Yes, there is a native opportunity we will have going forward where the runtime will basically be baked into the native and go out. That already happens on phones. It happens where JIT doesn't make sense once you push out. But we have a runtime. Um, even if it's native, it's just put in earlier um, if, we, if we do that. We have some libraries. Yeah, we need libraries. We need array and that kind of thing. And uh, we need an editor. Yeah, we got to write stuff. 
We need that, and uh, we probably need a compiler. Okay, that's kind of .NET. And from Microsoft's perspective, they could tell you all the distinctions between those four things, which have generally been in four distinct, very different teams. Okay, but for us in general, it's been yeah, that's what I do for a living. It's been one big blob. And I want us to get a little closer to one big blob than what we've been able to hear from uh, discussions of this. So what does it take to develop and how do we make this make sense in terms of our process? So first, let's organize it. Let's just lay it out. So you have an editor, and then that is, comes how there's a compiler involved. And we have some libraries. But the libraries, actually, there's several important library categories. So for one, we have a set of things I am going to call basic libraries. I struggled this, with this word because once upon a time, the word you would have put here would have been the word core. That word's been used associated with BCL in the past. But I can't do that anymore because it would be exceedingly confusing. And I struggled with the word, and I came up with the word basic. It's nothing to do with Visual Basic. This is just the old BCL stuff. So this is array, and it's innumerable, and it's link, and it's all this stuff that comes along, and it's an inherent part of what you do as .NET. And we need some UI libraries, okay? So we need something along the way to communicate, and we need some data libraries. So the very concept of, of UI libraries in our world is pretty vague. So that could be, let's get rid of that. We don't need that purple box anymore. Um, I'm going to call this delivery, li delivery libraries or delivery framework because this includes ASP.NET, it includes UWP, it includes WinForms. I actually think WinForms still has a future. Does anybody agree with me? Nobody, really? Okay, you come back here in two years and tell me if there's a talk on WinForms in two years, because um, I might be giving it. Um, but, <laughs> but no, I think that WinForms actually, because of its simplicity, um, actually still has a, has a future. Um, it just is going to require that we get off of this complete, we're going to do everything on the web crap that we've been doing and get back to the fact that some things don't belong on the web. And once we get back to that, I think WinForms will have a future again. Um, but we don't have to argue that. That's a different conversation. But we do have ASP.NET fundamentally is in that box right there. Now, this is wrong because, well, that's not where the compiler goes. Really, the compiler's job is just to pull all that stuff together. And there's one thing that's still missing from this slide, and that's your code. Okay? So now, can you guys just give me a little bit of feedback here? Is this, can you relate to this as a way you do your job? Does this make some sense out there? Nods heads, no nods heads. What do you think? Does this, does this make some sense? Because I want you to understand what's coming in relation to what you actually do. John, did you have a comment? Are you including all the tool changes in compiler? Uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's say tool change. You're right. There's other things in the tool chain other than just compilers, and I'm just saying compilers. So let's, let's clarify that. Okay. So this is the way I'm going to talk about your job. And I'm going to talk about it from that perspective rather than Microsoft, what group, who reports to who, and all that crap. OK. So the first thing I want to do is kind of get it out of the way a little bit so I have some more room. And then I accidentally went back to libraries. I apologize for that. Um, the editor, what do we have? Visual st I'm going to stick with the stuff that I know I'm afraid I did not put writer on here. It probably should be. Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and probably Project Writer should be there as well. Then we have your code. It's your code. I don't have much to say about it. You have a lot to say about it. Delivery libraries, what do we have? We have UWP, WPF. We have WinForms. I didn't put it on the slide. Uh, we have ASP.NET 4.X, and we have ASP.NET Core, and we have Xamarin Forms. And it's more of Xamarin than just Xamarin Forms. I just decided to clarify by saying Xamarin Forms. So far, everybody's still good, right? Nothing hard yet. Data libraries, well, that's I'm going to put any framework 6 and EF core. I did not put ADO.NET on here because there's really not changes, but to let you know if you haven't already heard, ADO.NET does go to core. So it is in the .NET core framework, but there's complexities in where I put it. How many of you use ADO.NET instead of Entity Framework? Not very many. Okay, good. Good for me to know. Okay, then we have the basic libraries. And here we have the .NET framework, and I'm kind of munging some things a little bit together, but everything other than the runtime. We have CoreFX, which is one of the names given to .NET core pieces that are living outside of the runtime. And we have Xamarin, which is sort of a big blob um, that I stuck in there to represent um, the pieces of mono that exist outside of the runtime. Okay, still with me? 
Then we have the runtime. The runtime, we have CLR, we have core CLR, and we have mono. Okay? Now, you look at this and you say, well, all those things that are along the middle, they say core, they must be part of .NET Core, and you're absolutely right. And the things along the bottom, well, that looks like Xamarin. So it's mono for Xamarin is one of the ways that whole group has been described. Now, you'd think this once across the top would be simple too, but we couldn't have that. We're building a, one of these little graphic things and we need to make it nice and complicated. And so we need to do something hard here. So there's the hard thing and I can't make that with like rounded corners. Um, so what we're saying here is that ASP.NET Core and Indie Framework Core will run both on Core and on the old framework. Okay? There are many good reasons for this. I won't go into them, but one of the things you can do is if you really want to do ASP.NET Core, you can do that without committing to .NET Core. Okay? So, there's various versions of this slide. And at this point, your eyes should be crossed and going, I just want to develop code. That's a reasonable thing to say when faced with variations of this slide. Okay? So, actually, surprisingly, for perhaps, Microsoft actually understands that. And it actually surprised me. Because a year ago, six months ago, I was having conversations like, oh my gosh, you got no idea how badly people's eyes glaze over. Six months before that, I was going, do you have any idea what it's like to stand up on stage? Now, keep this straight. ASP.NET 5, um, MVC 6, Indie Framework 7. And at least we got past that garbage. So at least we did that. Okay, but still, it's still pretty messy. Okay, so can you explain that to your boss? Do you want to explain that to your boss? That gives me a headache to think about. So no, I don't want to explain that to anybody. It's a mess. So let's take a time out. And Microsoft actually did this as well as, as me screaming. Microsoft actually also said, yeah, no. This is a lot. So let's see what we can do to make this better. Now, there's, I'm saying that as though Microsoft did this only for you, but what I'm going to explain also made Microsoft's life in order of magnitude easier. And before I go there, I want to just briefly talk about open source. So open source is great. I'm not saying open source is bad. Open source gives us a lot of really cool things. You pick your favorite up here. Maybe you can add a couple more things. Open source brings us really cool things. This is the right track to be on. But it's not without its challenges. And in challenges, one of the things is some vague quality metrics. And I mean two things by this. One of which is a general rule on the internet. There's a general rule on GitHub. There's a general rule wherever you're going for your open source stuff. What beta means is pretty vague. There's things that have been out there with everybody using them quite happily, cold betas, like still. Okay? And there's other things that are out there with betas that, oh my gosh, please don't touch that. Okay, so it's a little vague. And from Microsoft's perspective, the big thing to understand here is that Microsoft's idea of completion has changed entirely. Once upon a time, before 2017, if Microsoft gave you Visual Studio 2015 with .NET 4.0, 5.2, uh, 4.5.1, and uh, C Sharp 6, and you could say, great, and a new version of any framework, all bundled together, great, happily, I'm very happy. I have this bundle that comes together and is quite nice. Microsoft last spring um, released ASP.NET Core and .NET Core in release, and they said, oh yeah, the tooling's a little weak. Like, oh, well, there isn't any, and gosh, on the other hand, the, the build system we have in there for ASP.NET Core, yeah, that's going away. Okay? This is what I mean by quality metrics. This has changed and it will not go back, at least not for a very long time. And so this makes the world you look at look different. And if you don't understand that, you're going to stub your toes. So you're going to have to listen to people. You're going to have to find people. I fully believe that they will become voices in the community, that a group of you decide to trust this person, and a group of you decide to trust this person. Maybe it'll be me, maybe it'll be John, maybe it'll be you. But there's going to be people that say, this is what I think right now about going forward. And as part of that, I will tell you what I think. But please, I want to m do the best I can and ask me questions if I'm not clear on this, as to where it's my opinion about where you should go versus what's actually real. And everything I've said right now I think is real. Okay, but in a little bit, I'm going to tell you some things that are real, like this is what I think you should do, and that's opinion. 
So uh, I just said various meaning of what beta means, uh, changes during beta, things will change a little bit more, the whole build system changes. Oh, they'll be able to upgrade it. Oh, that means everybody in my team has to upgrade on the same day. Thank you. That's not easy. Um, managing granularity. So I worked on a, or at least I saw, a node project. I swear this is true. The sad thing is I counted. Um, it had in its packages file 900 entries. 900. Your brain exploded someplace around 100. Okay, so it's just crazy what's out there in terms of granularity. Hopefully .NET will have some sense about this, and we will not go that far, because really you should never, ever, ever have more items in your packages files that you can evaluate the current status of. If you can't figure it out, don't put it in there. Okay, yeah, there's this little pad left problem that happened. Why did it happen? Because people didn't care. They weren't following. They couldn't keep up with the current status of the things that they were using. And the synchronization of releases will be different. Okay, so I will tell you right now that there has been an announcement that Visual Studio 2017 will be allowed, will be, there's an announcement that Visual Studio 2017 will be released in spring of 2017. Okay, nice. There's also been an announcement that .NET standard, I'll tell you in a minute what .NET standard is, 2.0 will be released in approximately spring 2017. Those two releases will probably not be simultaneous. I'm sure everybody would love it if they were. We would love it, they would love it, everybody would love it. They are not going to fight very hard for it. So if one's ready, it'll go. If the other's ready, it's, it'll go. They're not trying to coordinate that. That's a different world. We just need to know we're in a different world. And then we can be happy. We can learn a new patterns. We can figure it out. Okay, and then uh, the roadmaps will be crap. Okay? I'm not going to say that any lighter than that. You should not, if somebody's doing a roadmap right now, three years out, open source stuff, things will change, it will change. Be a little bit patient with that. Don't bet a lot on roadmaps anymore. You go back two years and look at the roadmaps and tell me if you agree with me. Okay? So, uh, yeah, uh, they will be not very dependable. That's an opinion, I'll say that. Okay, and the thing is that this is why you were in Microsoft. If you're in the Microsoft world, if you wanted to have 900 packages in your uh, dependency file, you already left. Okay, you're not there anymore. So Microsoft needs to address these things, and they actually have. And so how do we go back to this, okay, and say, crap, wh how do I even make sense of this? Okay, so first of all, I'm going to argue you can do this. You can do this, no problem. You can handle your code, no problem. I'm going to argue you know what delivery platform you want, no problem. Okay, I'm going to argue this far, you are totally good. I'm also going to say that you guys, as a general group, except for like three of you, already made a decision on your data platform. You've got this. This part, you're good. This far, you're good. The problem is that the rest of this, you never had to think of at all. Zero. Not a bit. Now, oops. Oops. What's going on over there? That's all the stuff I never thought about. What's going on there now? So Microsoft did a great and wonderful thing, which they did an appalling job of explaining, and that was all of that is now, can be now considered under an umbrella called, called .NET Standard. Okay, all of that, all of that can now be considered .NET Standard. Now, that's not entirely true because there's some NuGet packages that you need, a lot's gonna come out on NuGet. Not all of that will be in .NET Standard, but there is a big part of that, like, um, Everything you think of is .NET. That's, that's part of .NET standard. So you're going, great, what's .NET standard? And you go, yeah, okay, so I'll tell you this, and then I'll tell you it in English. Okay, so the .NET standard, actually, I've got it here. Okay, it contains all these things. Okay, there it is. That's the definition of it. And so it's the .NET standard is, is an API. It's rules. It's a documentation. It's kind of like a standard, except it doesn't follow standard format because, wow, um, Let's see how we're going we're gonna to actually give you this. How can you actually get a hold of it and look at it? Okay? Yeah, we're going to do that in code. We're going to give you a bunch of libraries. And you're supposed to match those libraries. And that's what we're going to do. And there's some reasonable reasons behind this. But as people start talking about what .NET standard is, they often then also fall over into how it might be implemented. And they start talking about redirects and blah, 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 blah. And none of that you care about. You don't care whether a particular piece is taken and written for whole on the platform you're interested in, completely just rewritten, or whether it's a redirect from a piece of standard code. All you care is that it works. So .NET standard is a whole bunch of rules that if everybody follows, what you can do is write your code once. Well, gosh, 
That's what you wanted in the first place. Let me just write to one thing. Don't make me write this to .NET Core and this to .NET Framework, and I've got to make this decision. I've got to do that. You don't have to do that. That's the whole point of .NET Standard. So, uh, and, and does anybody, I mean, this is something some of you guys do know about. So does anybody want to, to say that I'm wrong about that? A pretty good explanation? Okay. So all this stuff you hear about .NET Standard, and you hear a lot of it, and it's terribly confusing. And oh my gosh, now you've got to keep .NET Core and .NET Standards, right? .NET Core, Core, everything's Core. Core is the new stuff. .NET Standard is this overarching umbrella. It's an overarching umbrella. So why do we need this really complicated chart? Okay, wow. What the heck? So what this says is that .NET Standard 2.0, I'll start on the side so you can easily look over there. .NET Standard 2.0 will be supported by the next version of .NET Core. I can't promise I have a name for that, I can say, but you could probably guess it and you wouldn't be far off. Um, the next version of .NET Core, the next version of Mono for Xamarin Platforms, and the next version of UWP it will be supported by 4.6.1 because it is largely defining what, what .NET standard is. This solves a problem you may have heard about where .NET Core just doesn't have enough APIs. You just can't do enough in it. Okay? It solves this problem by saying that .NET Core, to me, .NET standard must promise to do all these things that you, by the way, think you need for your development. So it matters to you whether these things are available. So for these things will support uh, 2.0. Now, how confused are you right now? On a scale from 1 to 10, who wants to tell me that they're confused above an 8? You're totally confused. You're totally freaked out. You get no idea what I'm talking about. Okay. How many of you totally have it? You're below a 3. You've got this. You understand. I've explained it. You totally have it. Good. There's some, some good. That's more. Okay. Unless other people were just holding their hands down here. I couldn't see them at all. Okay. So most of you are in the middle. Okay. The idea is over, you really need to get this. So take, take my approach to it, listen to other people's approaches to it, and get where you understand. Dot .NET Standard, you write your code saying it will, your code will write to dot .NET Standard, which means you will only use pieces that are in dot .NET Standard. You are not going to use an out-of-date, obsolete version of XPath. It's not there. You're not, there's certain things that aren't there. The vast majority of them are things you will never know are not there. There's some things you might have to do a little bit differently. And the core for this, the thing that they worked off of, was largely .NET 4.6.1, which allows you to mostly do the things that you're doing. That. Not everything in .NET 4.6.1 is in .NET Standard. Everything in .NET Standard 4.6.1 will do. Does that make sense? You write to .NET Standard is somewhat limited, not massively limited, but somewhat limited, and then your code should be able to run anywhere. Do you believe me? You should not believe me, okay? Let me just say that. John's going to say something, and if he's not going to say you should not believe this, then I'll listen and get his question in a minute, but you should not believe that. Why should you not believe that? Oh, let's just pick one. The registry. Where's the registry in Linux? Anybody know? It doesn't exist, okay? But does that mean that we should not allow you to put information in the registry? But wait, the major reason you're putting information in the registry is because on a Windows platform, that is how you tell something, something permanent about a setting in your application. Well, Linux does that. It's called an INI file. So what's going to go to a registry in Windows should go, in most cases, to an INI file. Is it the same? No. If you're putting something in the registry for some other program to look at, your host can't do it. You have to do it some other way. You use a semaphore or something. Okay? Are you with me on all of this? Okay? So, yes, it's going to be there, but there will be some things, maybe 20. Think 20, something like that, that are going to either work fundamentally differently, or if you get on the wrong platform, it's just going to throw a runtime exception, which sucks. And I am, they have said very publicly they will be able to write analyzers. They have not yet said publicly they will write analyzers. And I recommend we hold our feet to the fire on that one because we need those analyzers. John, did you have a different question? Yeah.
yes. And I almost didn't show that part of the slide because it's actually quite simple. Remember, for, um, the, the .NET framework can hold uh, things that the .NET standard does not have. 4.6.2 introduced a couple of new APIs, a small handful of APIs. At one point, they believed that those APIs were going to be in .NET standard. They then decided that, the, uh, th that they weren't worth it and that there was very, very few people had used them and .NET standard 1.5. So there is a breaking change. It's the long story. There is a breaking change between 1.45 and 2.0. And it's believed to be extremely small, in fact, almost nobody. But the, there are a few APIs that were in 4.62 that were expected to be in standard that will not be there. Yeah, if you have anything that works on 1.5 that did not work on 1.4 then you could have problems. That is a great way to check it. And if you actually find to have a problem with that, um, you know, contact the team. Just because it might not be you, if you have trouble contacting the team and you don't want to click the little button up in the upper right of Visual Studio, you can also contact me. Okay, I will get that message to the team. Okay, I got about five minutes left. So are we on track? Scary, isn't it? That's a big, ugly thing. My suggestion, this is my suggestion, my opinion now is that you shouldn't touch .NET standard until 2.0, and then as soon as 2.0 it seems to be stable in terms of what you're hearing in the community, you should, in fact, begin writing your applications, your new applications, and convert your old at least to know where the problems are to .NET standard, because .NET standard gives you that flexibility going forward. And I am right now talking about a .NET 4.6 app, a normal old .NET framework app, what almost all of you have, Almost all of you do not have production core apps right now. That's your normal app. Look at moving that to standard. That's its role is to take you forward into the future with as little pain as possible. And before this, I thought this was going to be just only slightly better than what happened to Visual Basic programmers in uh, 2000. And now I believe that it is probable, high probability, that we're going to make this change with relatively little blood and tears that it's going to not be completely pain-free, but that, frames, that pain is not going to require very much morphine. It's, it's going to be okay. Okay, so don't expect it to be free, but also recognize that this change, because of this, it's not in standard, should be relatively good. They are desperately trying to make it all work right now because it does require rewriting almost all of the .NET framework. I'm going to skip over this. It goes back to that. This is a repeat of that slide. And now I want to talk about another topic quickly, which is uh, support tracks. I never thought I would have to stand up on stage and explain support tracks. And I'm so sorry. But there are two trains. You get to pick which train you're on. Well, there's three trains. How many of you want to be on the nightly build? OK, forget that. OK, so you're either on the long-term support or the fast track support. And here's the difference. Oops, let's just kind of look at that quickly. This is the difference, and I could not make PowerPoint work correctly. The dots not lining up on the top and the bottom when there's that little I can switch between track thing like you have on the subway, okay? They're supposed to be exactly in alignment. I just couldn't make PowerPoint do it. So you can easily switch at those spots. But if you jump onto the fast track train at 2.2, okay, jumping back onto the other train is likely to be difficult. Okay, so, so the problem with this is my guess, it is a guess, not even really an opinion yet, is that for two, the two series, you will want to be on fast track. Okay, and the reason is I don't think they're going to get it right. I think there's going to be lots of tweaks. I think 2.1, 2.2, I think these are all going to be relatively, yeah, you kind of got to get there. Okay, so that's my guess. Um, but then after that, you probably will want to be on the long-term support track because most of you, what you're used to. They gave us a version of Visual Studio, and 18 months later, they gave us another one. Well, then they changed that, and three months later, they gave us an update. But those updates were really, they were really pulled together. And now, yeah, not so much. These are bits and pieces around the edges, and it's going to take effort on your part to figure out when to go. So the, the difference between these is the three months, is that uh, you, three months after... They release the next one. The old one is no longer supported on the fast track. Okay? I, I hope that makes a little bit of sense. I'm going to go on just because I'm just about out of time. And uh, I do want to get to this. So the takeaways. I've lost my pointer. 
Okay, the takeaways from this are, first of all, I didn't go into this deeply, but in the history, I hope you kind of got someplace there, is that we really have to change. We were on a rock, the future was beautiful, and we couldn't get there. Okay, .NET was 15 years old. It could not go forward without massive change. We had to do this. This is not Microsoft trying to make your life difficult. So the second thing is that um, it looked really painful before .NET standard. Um, I was quite concerned as to how we were going to teach it. It's been a very painful year, and you should appreciate all the people, not me, because uh, I didn't do much of it, that really took a big bet on .NET Core, and as part of that, helped to make it better and understand that we needed .NET standard. Um, you need to pick the right support track for you. Um, I do think it's going to be difficult at first, and then this is going to be a great uh, strategy after that. Um, one of the things I think is going to happen is that it will be difficult for them to not want people to all go to something like a 2.2, and I don't know how they're going to handle that. So again, you are going to have to be more plugged in than you're used to being. You guys are all at this conference. You're used to being plugged in at some level. You'll want to stay plugged in this year. Um, go to 4.6.1 if you possibly can. If you're on an earlier version, upgrade to that as a first step. Uh, no, no reason to go to 4.6.2 uh, right now unless there's something in that update otherwise that you want, but the actual API surface area does not matter. Watch for standard 2.0 when it comes out. Use it if you can. I mean, give it a few weeks. Don't like to dump into something that you're not ready for, but um, I think you'll want to move forward onto that. And uh, switch to ASP.NET Core whenever you want to. I think they're, they're, they're getting that pretty good. Um, you can find out more about that in several talks here. And uh, watch for Indie Framework. I think it's behind. Um, Indie Framework is still struggling. They have an amazingly aggressive set of goals, and that has made it difficult for them to dot the I's and cross the T's on the normal, everyday stuff that you want. So keep an eye on Indie Framework. That might keep you from going to .NET Core um, on the, uh, you may not want to go to any framework core, so that may delay when you go to .NET Core. And then uh, I do think Core is a brilliant set of principles. It's great. It's modern principles. It's going to take us into the future, and I am very excited about it. I just don't want you to go into it thinking, yeah, I'm just going to do whatever Microsoft says. Because if you do that, you will go insane. And the reason you will go insane is you will listen to three different people at Microsoft and you will hear three different things. You will listen to 20 different people at Microsoft and you will hear 20 different things. So you're going to hear insanity out there. I do suggest that we, we, as a community, we try to coalesce around a couple of idea sets, however we do that, whether it's curated or whether it's individuals, so that you can say, you know what, I'm just going to listen to X. And it's probably not going to be Scott Hanselman anymore because Scott is one of the people that's out there pushing new stuff um, for different reasons. It's, I think it's going to be people in the community, and uh, we just need to find out the right way to do that, whether it's organizations, whether it's individuals, however we do that. But that is my story on the arc of .NET, and uh, I'm very excited about the future, very excited about the next 10 years, very excited we have a tool that can take us into it. And I want to thank you so much for sharing this ride with me, and uh, I'm going to thank you and let you go on with your day. So I hope you have a great day, and thanks very much.